Okay, welcome everybody. Welcome everybody. Settle in. Now we're having such a great talking time. That's great. But we, we, I only have 20 minutes for my talk. And um, this is the first talk of Tea Time. Welcome. Uh, the point of Tea Time is to exchange ideas, to get some sugar at the, sugar at the end of the day. <laughs> and uh, a little intellectual stimulation. People will talk about all kinds of things, what they're working on, an interesting paper they've read, what they think is important. Um, so I've chosen today to talk about uh, a problem rather than a solution method. So I'm going to talk right, uh, about what might be the n next big step in AI. Something I think, think about a lot. Uh, I have 20 s slides, which is breaking the rule of one slide per minute, per two slides, one slide, two minutes per slide. Uh, and so I'm going to go a little bit fast, and uh, we'll have plenty of time for questions afterwards, uh, at least a full 10 minutes for questions. And, but go ahead and ask me something that's not clear as we go along. I, I like that, and I, I think I can control it. So what's the m next big step in AI? Uh, well, as you know, AI has made a lot, a lot of progress, and I'm, I, I'm not even going to show you my usual slide of, you know, Watson and, and Go and self-driving cars and, and deep learning, um, I'm, uh, because I don't have time. Uh, but basically, if you think about all the things we've done, all the things that have been done, uh, AI has gotten pretty good at model-free learning um, and at planning with, with, in games. Really, the special thing about games is that we know the rules of the game. We know, we know what, what the possible operators are, what the possible moves are, and whereas in the world, maybe we don't know that. Um, so what obstacles remain? How far have we come? You know, do we have... Do we have uh, the singularity? Uh, obviously, no. What's, what's missing? We, and so I'm going to present the point of view of the, what we lack, our methods for planning, when the world model is imperfect, that is, when it is learned. And of course, that's the case. That's the real case. We learn about the world, and then we have to decide about it. So um, that's, that's the idea. That planning with a learned model in a five-word phrase is what the next big step in AI is. Okay. So I'm going to talk about this and say what I can in 20 minutes about it. First, I want to say it's not a really a strange view. Lo lots of people think this, and particularly, actually, I wouldn't say it's the normal view. Uh, with, if you look in machine learning, deep learning, people are not thinking this way. But, but among the leaders, like Jan LeCun, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, among a few leaders, they will say exactly this. What I interpret as exactly this, and uh, so it's not really an uncommon view. Uh, so Jan LeCun, in his standard talk, he comes to the obstacles to AI. What's, what do we have to do? Well, we have to learn models of the world. We don't know how to do that. We don't know how to reason and plan when we have those learned models of the world. And so he talks about, uh, his buzzwords are predictive learning. That's a great phrase. I like that. I like predictions too. Uh, he, he likes to call it unsupervised learning. I don't know what that is. I like to call it model-based RL. Okay, he likes to call it model-based RL, despite the story about the cake and the cherry. Uh, he, he also uh, will talk very favorably about model-based RL nowadays. And Yashua Benjo is the other one that I was easy for me to pick out uh, for, as, as, as supporting exactly this. So he was asked, what is his most important next step? And he said, learning how the world ticks. Predictive, learning, having predictive, causal, explanatory models of the world. Uh, he likes latent variables. Um, that's okay. Uh, but the point is, it's a predictive explanatory causal model of the world. It tells you how it works and you, you can think about it. So, so, so this, is, this is not just my crazy idea. I mean, it should be your crazy idea too. If you, what is the, the biggest problem remaining in AI? Uh, what, what is it that we don't know how to do that we need to know how to do? And I think it's this simple. And it, so I like to think of it this way. The, the simplest way of thinking about intelligence is that intelligence is just knowing a lot and using, being able to use that knowledge flexibly to achieve your goals. That's what intelligence is. Um, of course, you know, what exactly do those statements mean? It means we don't know how to do it. But really, it's really not that much more than that. You have to know a lot about how the world works, and you have to be able to use that knowledge to achieve your goals in a flexible way. And we would call it reasoning, or we would, we'd use words like, uh, well, this is, these, these things are essentially what I mean by planning with a learned model. You know, the model is what you know a lot, and being able to use it is the planning part. So uh, planning, you know, to me, I'm, it's the same thing. We think about reasoning or thought. It means combining what you know to figure out what to do. And uh, also what I have, I would say, the world model is essentially knowledge. Uh, you know, it would be analogous to if we thought in reasoning terms about propositions or about facts about the world. It's a very simple, common sense view. Okay, so 
And so I'm trying to decompose this five word phrase and break its parts. I'll give you some sense what I mean by it. I really just mean this, this idea played out and then of course we just become a bit mathematical before we're done, which is what we want. Um, so the learned model part. Well, obviously the learned model is a model of the world. Okay, so in a, if it was, if it was a Markov decision process, the mathematical framework we like to use in reinforcement learning and more and more in, in all of AI, uh, we model the world's, we think of the world's having, having a dynamics, uh, an evolving, uh, uh, an evolution property, a, a physics. Uh, we think about state transition probabilities, probability of a po each possible next state, S prime, given the current state and an action. And we think about expected uh, rewards for being in that state and doing that action. And so we would be, to make a model of the world, we would, we would make models of these two things. So we just put hats on them in order to we're done. Uh, that's, what we, that's the kind of thing we're going to try to do. Okay, so, uh, but a learned model is not just the dynamics. And we often we think of it that way, but it's, it's more than the dynamics, it's the state. Your state is a critical part of how you're modeling the world works. Uh, this state thing that I'm talking about, you know, this, so, um, we have to, and we're not, we're not really, we, in, in classical um, textbook reinforcement learning, we assume that the state is given to us. But really the state has to be constructed. And uh, it's really some function of our ob stream of observations and actions that's constructed. Okay, uh, because you, in general, we're gonna have partial observability. We can't see around corners. Uh, we can't see what's behind us. Um, we uh, can't see what's in our pockets anymore. We may remember what we put in them. Um, there's partial observability. And so you have to construct the state estimate from your experience. And um, you also have to choose, it's, it's more than that though. It's much more than partial observability. It's, it's really, maybe you've heard about the representation problem. Maybe you've heard about the International Conference on rep Learning Representations. Um, that is all about uh, constructing a good s representation of your situation so that you can learn efficiently. Okay, and that in our, in our reinforcement learning land, and it's basically your choice of your state representation. Which features do you use? What's important? What do you think is important? What do you think is unimportant? And so this is a very important part of your model. Okay, uh, so, so this, is, this, is, this, is, this, this is the notation I like to use. Um, states, actions, observation stream your observations. So you get them over time and you construct your next state from your old state from, and your most recent action, your most recent observation. And you construct it according to this function u, u for update, state update function. That's called the state update function. And um, this has got to be a learned function. So it's part of our constructing our model is constructing u. So it'll have parameters, it'll have to be learned. Okay? Okay. So that's an important part of the model. There's two things then. We have to learn the, the dynamics and we have to learn the statics or the state. Um, so the goal of, of, of the dynamics learning is to predict the state and other observations, but basically it's to predict the state. We want to learn a model of the world. You know, we want to predict what will happen if I do something. And, but this, the goal of, of learning state is, to, is, to, is, is, is in service of the dynamics, the predictions that are learning, that, that you're learning. You want to have, you know, you're going to try to predict what's going to happen, but you might not have enough information to predict it because you didn't remember something you needed to remember. And so the goal of state learning is really to enable good dynamics learning. And so these two interact, and they go on and on, and that's really a lot about the problem of learning a world model looks like, these two processes interacting. Good. The, the, this, this, okay, so this, this is deterministic, and it, it can always be deterministic. Um, and yeah, uh, the state is, is what we call the agent state. You think it's the agent's representation of the state? If you happen to believe in Bayes' learn, in, 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 uh, in um, Bayes' networks, beliefs, those kind of things, uh, you might, you would think of S as the belief state. Okay. So, it's, so it's a deterministic function that you update it from the last belief state. Okay, now this talk is all these, all these words, words, words. I, I, I had to put in a slide, this is my one picture, okay? So enjoy it. <laughs> uh, the picture uh, is of the overall architecture. It's, it's, uh, we have the world that we're interacting with 
And then we have our policy and our value function that, that, that helps us pick our actions. And the world generates observations. And then there's this box we don't often see. That's the U box. That's the state update. And it really just, you know, look at it. Look at that equation and that box. This U receives input and observation and action. And the last, the last state produces the new state. Okay? It's all the self-contained thing. That's the state update. Now this state, once you have it, you just send it to your policy or your value function and you pick your actions. And, but you also send it up to the model. The model, because it has to know the states, the actions, and the rewards in order to predict what the next one will be. It, somehow it learns. These, these, these diagonal dotted lines mean there's a learning process. So this is information that, that serves learning. This, this is a learning process. Okay? And then also the planner comes by. Why am I pointing? And changes the, uh, the policy as well. OK, now what I want, I just want to make a couple observations about this picture. It actually says some things. Uh, first of all, the model and the planner, they never see the observations. The observations are processed here. They're turned into state. And afterwards, we only see state. The observations don't appear anyway, anywhere. Um, and I think that's, that's, a, that's a, a little bit of a controversial, but, but it's obviously right. And if, I really was making a proper talk. I would go through all the steps and try to show it to you. But I, I'm settling here for just saying clearly that uh, I, I think it's not involved at all in, in the model building, in the model, or in the planner, or in the planning process. Observations don't matter. You don't like predict observations and then pretend you've seen them. You only work with state. Uh, so we're going to talk, one thing we are going to talk a lot today are this model and what are the inputs and outputs of the model? What does the model deal with? But right now I'm telling you just that it's that it's only dealing with state. And that's, this is symptomatic of my whole talk, uh, and the fact that this is a whole tricky problem of, of planning with a learned model, that you can't come charge directly at it. You have to sort of try to find pieces of it that you can say. And these pieces are often vague, but, they're, but they, they, we, there is something definite you can say, but th those things are also vague. So I'm saying definitely the model and the planner never see the observations. Um, uh, but, and they only see the state, but I'm not telling you exactly what the state is, okay? I'm being vague about the state. I've seen you draw this with GDFs as well. Are you going to jump to that, or are you going to yes. keep that out of the talk? Yes. No, I'm going to jump to that. Okay. Then I'm okay. Gonna uh, the planner, but the planner only sees the state, and what else? Now, given you, given this box here, then the states, essentially they come out of the world, and they are just like data. It's just as if you, see, you know, you can pretend that, oh, I was given states because you have this U-box that's giving you states. And so it's an important decomposition. And so if you predict a state, and you make a prediction about what the state will be, you will see this, what state U comes up with later. And so you can get a target for your learning. Um, and we're also decoupling the planning process, which is up here, from the learning process, which is in here. OK. Um, planning, that's what I was just trying to say a second ago, The planning, this, this thing, this, this Next big step, and it's a little bit tricky, a little bit difficult. You can't charge right at it. And this is something we learn as researchers um, uh, that that often, you know, a big problem. You 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 you, you want to solve it, but you don't always. To, the best strategy is not always to charge straight at it. Um, instead, we're going to creep up with it around the sides. Uh, maybe find out something a little bit about it, uh, and make and and write a paper with it short of solving the big problem. Um, so. So often you want to assemble the pieces, the pieces that will help with the big problem, but you can work on it on their own. Uh, do what you can, prior to, prior, uh, direct assault, identify the gaps, beware of the traps. I'm going to talk in the next two slides about two of the traps that people run into. And so I'm always trying to say, what can I say to get close, to, to say, to narrow down the solution without trying to directly get it, um, uh, even if in some sense it's a little bit vague or at least in the sense of being open to, to uh, being implemented in different multiple ways. OK, so here's a couple of the traps. Uh, and this is a whole talk, really. But in one slide, uh, the, I, I really feel the last 70 years of AI have taught us one sort of bitter lesson. And the bitter lesson is that the, the less we build in, the better things work. So the bit, you know, we try to build in our, our sense of how we think. We try to make it more knowledgeable, smarter. And it always ends up being counterproductive. Uh, it actually, 
in the long run, it's kind of, it always helps a little bit when we're doing it and it feels good, but in the long run it's bad. Okay, so you know, you know this now because it's, you know, you know at least some instance of this, like, like chess and go, um, those had all kinds of knowledge put in them that, was, that we've now taken out completely and, and, and get methods that work better. So alpha zero uh, has, is a, a Go and chess playing program. It's both. It plays both games with no knowledge to differentiate between chess and Go. And it has no opening book. It has no alphabet to search. It has no end game database. All the things that we celebrated um, uh, in chess. And it was just taken out and, they, and it, beats, it beats the best programs now. And so, but, but chess is really, it really happened over and over again. All it's happened in speech recognition. What is this deep learning thing you hear about? that it works speech recognition so much better, image recognition so much better. It, it, it's basically throwing away all the things that we tried to build in, all the pre-designed features that we tried to build in. Instead, we just take directly from the image and we just have lots of data and lots of computation and none of that built-in stuff. Uh, natural language processing, same, same story. So deep learning is the latest instance of this bitter lesson where we try to put things in. There's so much work putting things in and uh, we still make this, this, this error today, this trap. We fall into this trap today. There, there are lots of research, probably half of the research you'd see in, in, in the field uh, would be trying to take advantage of some human knowledge. And I'm just betting that that's gonna be counterproductive in the long run because of this lesson we've seen so many times. Okay, just one slide. Marlos. Uh, when, when you think about convolutional networks, for example, yes. don't they Yes. Okay, let's do that afterwards. <laughs> I, really, I, I really don't want to run over time. I got four minutes left. And uh, so let's, let's do that. Just save that question because uh, it's good. Um, I want to mention another tr common trap that I call the one-step trap. And this is thinking that you can do everything in single steps, in one step. I can predict the very next observation or the next state, and then if I want to predict something longer term, because what we really care about are longer term things, then we just iterate. Uh, our model many, many times, okay? And in theory, this works. And th you know, if you can make your one-step model perfect, then every long-term uh, long prediction that you would make from, the, from iterating the model would be perfect. But in practice, this is just a hopeless, hopeless approach. And you, you, you should acknowledge, you either acknowledge that this is hopeless is, <laughs> in practice, or you just do theory and you enjoy it. Um, but it just doesn't work, unfortunately. Because why doesn't it work? Well, in brief, the three reasons are, in a stochastic world, the iteration will involve branching. And, and so to, to look ahead, you know, 20 steps, you have to branch, you know, something to the 20th. And that makes it hopeless, exponentially complex. As you iterate forward, any small errors you have are amplified, and, and they become very extremely large uh, as you get more steps. And also, really, I, I even would... would, would, would would counter the, the, the whole inspiration for it was that, that one step things are supposed to be easy to learn, but they're actually, they're hard to learn, particularly when you have partial observability. So this is really common. People who talk about these sort of things are falling into this trap. Okay, now I, I, I apologize again for, for this talk being overviewy, um, um, but I think it's useful to, 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 to talk about this. So all the things that we're, we're working on and have worked on are the pieces of it. These are things that people in the group know about. They know, of course, about function approximation, and they know about off-policy learning. They know about DINA and the nonlinear DINA that, that Yi and Muhammad are working on. You know about GVFs is our prediction technology. The Horde is, is this architecture that has a massive number of predictions learned in parallel. Uh, options are our technology for saying things about temporally extended um, uh, ways of behaving rather than about one-step things. So options are, are, are uh, an answer to the one-step trap. And uh, prioritized sweeping is a way of doing search control. Intrinsic motivation curiosity is a way of structuring. I'll say some more about those at the end. Uh, and this is all about predictive knowledge and predictive state in um, TD nets have to do with doing it compositionally and, and doing it with temporal abstraction. And um, so this is, these are some of the pieces that we all, that fit into this. Um, okay, so let me try to say something interesting, a little bit concrete. What is a model? Uh, how is it used? Uh, a model is something 
uh, that takes the state <coughs> and something that you might do, and it predicts something about what would result. Obviously, that's vague. OK, so this process of predicting, this basic operation of using a model, I'm going to call it projection, so I can talk about it clearly. So I'm going to say we use the model to project, project into the future. We look ahead. Um, the state, of course, is the agent state, which is the output of the state update function. The something that the agent might do is going to be an option. An option is a policy and a termination condition, temporally extended. And so these commitments, I think we can do with, we haven't really lost anything by making these small commitments. Okay, so now we go further. Um, let's talk about this primitive operation, projection. It's in, what is the input to projection? Well, it's two descriptors, maybe feature vectors. It's got a, it has to receive a state, and has to receive an option described in some way, because we're going to use function approximation, so we're not going to think about distinct things. Uh, we're going to have features for them. So, a feature, so its input is a state and an option, and its output is also two estimates uh, about, and they're, let me say what they're about before they are. They're about following the option from that state. Okay? Now, th these are the two estimates, one and two. One is the expected return uh, while you're following the option. And the, uh, the second thing, so that's going to be something like this, like the expected, uh, the amount of reward you'll get if you start in that state and you follow that option until the option is done. That's the generalization of R hat. Okay, and the other one is you're going to say something about the next state. Okay, and I have to be vague because there's a big, there's a branch point here. We could, what can we say about the next state? We can say what its distribution is, its probability distribution. We can say what the expectation is of the next state or state vector. Or we can produce a sample um, from this distribution. Okay, so this is a big, a big choice. Now, in, in the tabular case from MDPs, Markov decision processes, we, this is really just a, a scalar. And this other thing is, is a probability distribution, the probability of the next state given the starting state and the action. That's, so that's a, a, a something of size, the number of states. Okay, and then everything's got to be done with functional approximation. And I am, I am done, so um, I, I'm out of time. But let me just finish this part. So uh, what should the, I, I mentioned these three possibilities. Um, the distribution model, uh, if, we, if we want to produce distributions, or a sample model if we're going to produce a sample of the next state, or the expectation, okay? And what are the pluses and minuses? Well, the distribution model is general, and it's deterministic. Uh, but it's huge, because it produces a whole distribution and all the things that might happen, the probabilities. A sample model is compact, it just produces one sample next state, but you still have to have, to have a generator that, that, that follows this distribution, and that involves much of the same complexity as would be involved here. So the expectation model is limited, but this is the one I like, uh, although, you know, we have, this, could, this could go either way. Uh, the expectation model is compact and deterministic, but it's limited, and the way you try to make up for its limitations, only producing the expectation, is that you, you try to s structure your state representation, and maybe you make your value function so that it's linear, which can also be done by enhancing the state representation. That seems most workable to me. So, um, the, 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 all the challenges in, in planning with learn model can be divided into these three categories. And I do this with everything. I, like, can I represent the, the the, what I'm trying to do, can I learn what I'm trying to do, and then can I discover. The learning and discovery distinction is something like, well, um, can I learn to answer these, these questions about the world? Uh, and I have learning algorithms for learning to answer those questions. GVFs gives us a, question, a language for questions. The discovery is the problem of where do the questions come from. And so we often work on things in this order. Uh, like we might assume that uh, we as researchers give the questions and then the algorithms work on the learning. Or we might even assume that we just, let's assume the learning is given, and discovery is given. Let's see, can we represent knowledge in this framework? So the last step, I usually try to avoid uh, discovery. Um, I'd like to make progress without it, but in the end you need to do it. And I have a few, I have sort of a vision of how it might be done, but I don't really, gonna, can't really, don't really have time to do it. But basically it's some way of ordering um, the asking the questions about, you know, first you ask about the, 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 the bare things, and then uh, you ask about, uh, you, you create policies to achieve those things, and then you uh, repeat with the new terms that you've created to, and the, the new policies that you've created. And you can, you have more and more to do, and you can order the, the, the order, the, the to, to make things manageable, because it's an infinite amount to learn, you can, there's, there are various heuristics for trying to order what you, what you learn. Okay, so uh, my take-home messages are, number one, 
the idea that planning with learned model may be the next big step for AI. Uh, the idea that much of the previous work that, that you've seen coming out of our group and in general in, in, in reinforcement learning uh, can be thought as, as building the pieces, perfecting the pieces that will be need to ultimately make an assault on this big problem. Um, when you do have a learned model, you have to do both the dynamics and the agent state. The agent state update, these two are highly interrelated, each serves the other. The hardest step is discovery. Um, there are all these, there are a few pitfalls that we need to avoid. So we have to sort of proceed somewhat deliberately, sometimes maybe not trying to go all the way. But we can make progress and we can see the outlines of where we ultimately need to go. Thank you very much. Okay, we have a few minutes, even with my running over, we have at least six minutes for questions. And uh, Marlos. Marlos. Uh, Marlos. Marlos asked the question about convolution neural nets. Uh, aren't those... Uh, don't they have human knowledge? Don't they have human knowledge? Because they, they're convolutional, so they have a human knowledge at least of the translational invariance. And so, um, so it's not this the lesson, the bitter lesson that we we have, we always, uh, whenever we try to build stuff in, it, it is counterproductive. Uh, this is not an absolute. Uh, they're always, they're, I'm not saying we should never build anything in. It's just, it's just an observation that historically, there are all these big cases where we've made, made the failure on the one side. We've made the failure of putting in things that later we need to take out because they're counterproductive. It doesn't mean that everything is like that, but it does, it does say that whenever you see something put in, you should consider maybe, maybe that can be learned rather than being put in. And so maybe convolutional networks, maybe the convolutional part is not essential and maybe it would be better if that wasn't provided, particularly if you're thinking about how biology works, in which case you don't have uh, 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 a regular grid of pixels and convolution makes less sense. Um, so, but it's not an absolute, I mean, so you say, well, why even build TD Lambda into your algorithms, you know? Uh, Basic things, the idea is that you still need to build things in, you, but it would be there are things that are more like, like general principles uh, rather, than, uh, rather than the contents. I, 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 yeah, I actually have a good say. The contents of the knowledge should not be put in, but the principles for testing it and improving it should be put in. Good. Mohammed. Since we're writing a model, yeah. the model would be imperfect in some sense, right? The model would be? Yes. Yes. When we are using that model, we need some notion of uncertainty. The model should tell us how certain it is in its prediction. So do you think that would play a role in this next big step? Yes, definitely. If we want to quantify uncertainty, then maybe we should be looking into what Bayesian community has been thinking about for a while. What do you think about that? No. <laughs> <laughs> With you right up to the end there. The, the problem is, I mean, I'm just, I am being funny, but, but I, I, I do think that what, you know, they're building uncertainty, they're, they're really building it in. And like the whole point of, uh, of a, a Bayesian method is that you have a prior over the whole, and you can't have a prior over the world. I mean, I know some researchers propose that, that you have a prior over the world's dynamics. Uh, but I think that's, I, that seems crazy to me. Um, yeah. Some Mohammed. So, uh, if I were to uh, translate that into the set, like into a sentence, the verb would be plan. But it appears to me that learning would be like, if not important, as important as learning. And that is, so we have like an incomplete model of the world, and we have partial models of different parts of the world. And uh, it seems to me like a big thing humans do that the machines are not able to replicate uh, as good right now is combining these partial models to create even new models like uh, so the com so it, it kind of like it's more about learning than planning so what do you think about yeah, certainly that? today i've talked more about I, I you know both you and Mo the two Mohammeds uh, <laughs> uh, have pointed out that, that the, my talk is ends, ends up being more about learning than it is about the planning part um, and whereas, whereas really they're both ha have things to, to be figured out in them. Um, um, and I think that's just a measure of where we are or maybe where I am. Um, yeah. 
And what we would do with partial models, well, should we think of it as partial models that need to be assembled? Yes, I, that's probably a good way. We should, you know, even though the idea of thinking of having a model is a little bit indirect. Maybe you should think about having knowledge. I know I can predict this and I can predict that. And so I, and I have this whole bag of predictions and I call the collection of them my model. What you, what you really need is, is something that you can say, here's a state, and here's a way of behaving. What can you tell me about what would happen if I did that? Um, yeah, knowledge about the world. Question back? So what do you think about meta learning? Like, so let's say like we have a part of the eight agent uh, and a part of our state S, and then like uh, it updates you, we modify for part of our program, uh, like our part of, of the fire agent, we just uh, have in the longer well, so, meta learning is going to be the question is about meta learning, um, and that that is definitely uh, going to be involved. Um, it's kind of such a general idea, though it can be used for for multiple parts. Um, but I would call the stuff where you're like learning representations, I would call that meta-learning because it's learning something that will support further learning. Um, I'm not sure I understood all your question, but... Martin. Um, so in one of your slides you said knowledge is about the same as facts. Knowledge is the same as facts, yeah, but roughly. You look at like these networks, the knowledge is implicit in those millions of weights. So I think it's a stretch yeah. to call it facts. So in your, <laughs> both for your states and for your model, what kind of representation are you looking at? Well, it is a stretch. You know, we know, I know if, if you take any fact, I mean, I don't think you could find in our brain a proposition. I think you'd find a bunch of weights and a, and a bunch of connections. And I, th I think it is. I, th I think that's fair to say that we, what we mean by a knowing basic truths about the world, the sun will rise tomorrow, the, the podium is hard or whatever. Um, these are, uh, so, you know, it's a, it's a strongly reductionist view because um, I'm trying to say that these things that we think of as fancy as our propositions and our reasoning can just be captured by planning. Um, yeah, I'm a, uh, I feel a little apologetic about it because I'm Canadian, uh, <laughs> but, but we have to, we have to try to actually solve this problem of figuring out how the mind works. And so we have to be a little bit reductionist or rude, oh, rude, <sighs> that's terrible. Okay, one last question. Yeah. Uh, so you talked about this briefly at the ah. end, but uh, sorry. Uh, Russian. But what does the what does the policy do with the model? So like you you mentioned Dyna, right? So Dyna kind of uses the model to generate extra experience and it uses that to learn values. But uh, it seems like if you just were doing that, you could do it in some other way. But if you have a learned model, can you do something smarter with it in terms of acting? Like what do you do with it? So so. As I said, we didn't talk. We talked more about learning than about, about, about planning. But the outlines, Dyna does for me provide an outline of the whole thing. Dyna, Dyna is a system which which learns a model and and learn and learns directly from experience, but also learn plans with the model by imagining uh, things that might happen using the model, and then learning from those imagined things as, as if they had really happened. And that is that is, I think, uh, for me, that's a um, a pretty good model for when we're for the final solution that planning uh, could work just by imagining single single steps single projections by having single projections that, that correspond to multiple steps and say oh if I, if I, if I did this th there it would take me there oh that would be good I'll, if I ever get there I will do that when I um, I think that to me that's that's a good model um, but there are other models of planning um, so this is one of the cases where I'm trying to, I'm deliberately being a little vague. I'm trying to, can I say anything without committing to a particular plan? Should we use Monte Carlo tree search? 
or should we use this the dyno or dynamic programming style planning? Um, yeah, for me, I'm, I, I, I'm go, Dyna is my go-to model of planning. Okay, maybe it's limited. That's what I am thinking about first. Well, uh, thank you very much. Hope you all will come uh, Wednesday for the next talk, which is going to be Martha, Martha White. <laughs>